So I thought I would start with just a couple comments from last time. Um, so uh, first of all, I want to thank Aaron for kind of leading a, a large portion of um, our first reading. We did a kind of line by line approach and I thought it worked really well. Um, since then, I shared a folder of supplementary secondary source reading with you all. Get a chance, look at, um, look at all of that, especially Lorenzo Chiesa's work on the not to on logic and God in Lacan. He has a really good breakdown of seminar 18 in starting on page 81. Um, and so check that out. Also check out a phenomenal article by an author called Jelica Sumik in the Umbra journal from 2007, which is dedicated to the theme of semblance. I also put it in the Dropbox folder. And I actually just wanna say a few things about um, her article. It's called On the Path of the Semblant um, because it really helped me contextualize this concept in a social and political way that I was trying to elaborate when we first met before, where I was drawing out that distinction between in philosophy, you have kind of realism versus nominalism. And I think uh, this author, Jelica Sumik, clarifies that indeed, um, and Lacan clarifies as well, that he is no nominalist by any stretch. Yet at the same time, we should remember and remain attentive to the fact that it was Jeremy Bentham and his theory of fictions that Lacan turns to in seminar 11 on the ethics, where he elaborates precisely the way that you cannot grasp the real without going through the fiction, so to speak. And that Bentham, despite the fact that Lacan is no utilitarian, as we know, he's much more in the field of ethics, he's much more of a Kantian, right? Um, yet, uh, he absolutely uh, follows through with Bentham's core proposal that uh, the general status of social uh, political values are intrinsically fictional. And that from the standpoint of a philosophical analysis, it's much more productive to in fact analyze these things as a subject's mode of access to enjoyment. For Bentham, it's enjoyment, qua pleasure, and pain. And of course, Lacan through the Freudian death drive will kind of elaborate on that. But the key point that's worth tethering with is that there is a central concept, which we're all familiar with, that Lacan develops from his reading of Jeremy Bentham's theory of fictions, which is the notion of quilting point. So quilting point is Lacan's early way in his early teaching to talk about the way in which the real can only be spoken of when it quilts onto the symbolic, when it quilts onto the signifier, right? And that the status of that quilting, the status of the symbolic in that operation is of a fictional status or is of the semblant. He wouldn't use that term semblant, but he would use fiction, right? By the time of seminar 18, uh, this possibility of a quilting point begins to erode precisely in his development of the four discourses. And I urge you to read this article by Sumik precisely because she shows the way that the discourses, the four discourses of Lacan are in essence building up to replace the sort of important function of quilting point of, of, you could almost think of it almost like as a dialectical point with a new concept that will develop the later quote unquote Borromean knot period of Lacan, which is called the littoral, right? Which is kind of like this borderline surface. So it's no longer um, feasible in Lacan's teaching to think about this kind of quilting or fusion of signifier um, with the real. There's something fundamentally disjunctive and that um, that means that there's something of the real which is also of semblance, right? 
And so every discourse produces a semblance, right? Even Jewish senses of the semblance, right? So there's this kind of structural fate, which the discourse theory opens up for Lacan. Um, but the title of the seminar on a discourse that might not be a semblance is a clear reference to the discourse of the analyst insofar as the discourse of the analyst is the discourse which can, unlike the other three, uh, locate the production of semblances, right? Because even in the production of the end of analysis of like what the analyst sand um, produces, it's almost like a mutual um, semblant. It, Sumik shows that there's no other discourse which has that uh, unique capacity. So I thought that was an extremely important point. I also want to read a quote uh, to demonstrate this. This is actually a quote from Lacan. He says, quote, psychoanalysis is a discipline which produces itself only through the semblant. The latter is denuded to the point that it unsettles the semblants, which support religion, magic, piety, and all that which conceals the economy of joissance. Only the discourse of the analyst can make do with a semblance because, and this is the key point, the position of the agent in the discourse of the analyst um, creates a social bond that produces a semblant. And you remember this key point, which is each discourse produces a unique form of a social bond. And in so doing, Lacan shows that what a social bond does is that it heightens an ant antinomy between the real and the semblant, right? Um, Sumit goes even further, and she says that, um, in a very Malarian way, that Lacan's in seminar 17, so the seminar prior to the one we we're reading, had developed the four discourses as a founding gesture of trying to make psychoanalysis cohere with science. And she says the construction of the four discourses is an operation comparable to Galileo and Newton's founding gesture of science, a gesture which consists in the strict separation of the real from the semblant, right? In other words, the four discourses are Lacan's attempt at circumscri circumscribing the place of the real in psychoanalysis while limiting the imperialism of semblants. Just like the discourse of science that only reads, determines, deciphers the knowledge of the real, but writes it down in mathematical formula in order to transform it, psychoanalysis also presumes to be able to determine the real that it deals with and to find a way to transform it. So you could say that um, why Lacan is, is insisting that he's not a nominalist has to do with the, 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 the rivalry of psychoanalysis qua the discourse of science, which is also a point that the great Lacanian theologian Lorenzo Chiesa, I call him Lacanian theologian, I think he is this, um, he also points this out very, very nicely. Um, she says, it is by redefining what is at stake in this function that Lacan, Lacan comes to effect by replacing the term fiction, this whole Benthamite thing, with semblant. This is a singular devaluation. This is a downgrading of the term whose role was before about pinpointing the real within the symbolic. But now if there's a non-rapport between the real and the symbolic, what downgrades the semblant is precisely its function, right? So he kind of inverts it. And so just as there is a non-rapport of the sexual relation, there's a kind of higher level non-rapport in the kind of metaphysics of Lacan's teaching um, between real and semblant, right? And so no longer is the quilting point a kind of dialectical gesture, so to speak. Um, so I thought these points were uh, uh, use, uh, worth making. Um, uh, we also know that as a review, um, 
you know, Lacan basically says that logical positivism is not a, like how psychoanalysis differs from logical positivism um, is that um, it is not satisfied with this notion that a signified, whether it be um, represented in the real as a kind of yes or a no, um, that there is actually like a truth within the no. There's a truth within the falsity. There's a truth within the semblance, right? And that there's something unique to homo sapiens, to speaking beings um, that experience this um, unique status of truth as fiction, right? And so truth progresses only by the structure of the semblance. And of course, it's important to note also that all of the examples of semblance, this is a point that Sumik and Chiesa both make in the seminar 18, uh, are largely examples from nature, right? So he's trying to show the expansive way that the theory of the discourses don't only apply to human speech, but the way that they're actually conditioned um, far beyond that. So anyways, I thought those were some very interesting points. Let me now start to share my screen. And let me also, before I share, or while I share, invite Andrew to say a couple things because he's done some research um, from last time. He's looked into some things for us. So would you like to say a couple points, Andrew? Uh, wait, where can I, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, actually, I think you just covered a lot of what I uh, was leading to. So I think it, it, I can come back to it. But I think you've already, you've kind of crossed the bridge already. There's not really a need to, to okay. yeah. I guess, I guess your, your main point was that in the French um, sources of seminar 18, there's a lot of questionable stuff with Gallagher, um, which I think we knew going into this that we have some limitations in terms of the Gallagher translation. There's maybe some omissions, right? Um, we're not sure about the best choice of words and wording. Um, although, it's a little bit like when you look into it with you using DeepL, you do get a little more clarity on the way that he's thinking, or it seems to be the way he's thinking about the dialectics with re relation to the real. It actually came a little bit more clearer in just what you're talking about right now. Uh, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, in looking at the original French, but in any way, in any case, go ahead. There yeah, from here. Okay, cool. So I guess I can kick us off, uh, unless anyone would like to uh, uh, begin. I'd be more. I'd welcome anyone to uh, take a stab at reading if they'd like. You don't have to be the plus one if you read, like you don't have to be the interpreter while you read, you just can read and then other will do the work of interpretation, you know? I'll read, it's all right, I'll do it. Let's do it, let's go. Okay, can you see the screen? Okay, Mark. Yeah, I can see, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, I have a, uh, a Scouse accent, so if you can't understand me, I'm sorry, it's the frictive phonetic, but- uh... <laughs> I, I love it, brother, I think it's beautiful. Please go on. All right, it's uh, okay. If I was looking through these sheets, it was not to assure myself, but to reassure myself about what I, I said the last time, the text of which I do not have at the moment. I have just been comp complaining about it. Remarks of this kind have come back to me. I do not have to go to any trouble for that. It happens that some people were asking themselves at certain points of my discourse the last time as they, exp as they express it, what I was getting. Other remarks came to me from elsewhere. That is, that it is very hard to hear at the back of, that, at the, back of the room. I will, I will try. I was absolutely unaware of it last time. Sorry, it's, uh, the screen's moving too much. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I went too fast, sorry. I was um, absolutely aware, unaware of it the last time. I thought that the acoustics were just as good as, it, as good in, in my, the previous amphitheater. If you don't mind giving me a sign when my voice lowers, despite myself, I will try to do my best. So then, 
at certain points, people have asked themselves the last time what I, what I was getting at. In truth, this sort of question seems to me to be premature, to be too premature to be significant. Namely, that it is people who are far from being insignificant. People who are very well informed from whom this remark was reported. And sometimes, quite calmly by themselves, so I said sometimes quite calmly by themselves, sorry, I was moving up there. It would, it would perhaps have a greater implication given precisely what I put forward the last time. If they were to ask what I'm, what I'm starting from or even where I want you to start from, already this has two meanings. This perhaps means to go somewhere, and again, this may also mean to get a move on from where you are. This, this what I'm getting at is in any case a very good example of what I put forward about the desire of the other, chez vous. What does he want? Obviously, you can say it right away. You are much more comfortable. This is an opportunity to note the fact that the factor of inertia that is constituted by the chez vous. Am I pronouncing that right, chez vous? Chez vous. Chez vous. At least when you can answer it. This, indeed, is why in analysis one strives to leave this question in suspense. Nevertheless, I clearly specified the last time that here I am not in the position of the analyst. So that, in short, I believe I am obliged to answer this question. And in saying this, I ought to give the reason why I've spoken. I spoke about the semblance and I said something that is not common knowledge. First of all, I insisted. I laid stress on the fact that the semblance presents itself as what it is is the primary function of truth. There, there is a certain I speak that brings this about. And it is not superfluous to recall, to recall it in order to give to this truth, which gives rise to so many logical difficulties. It's correct positioning. This, this is all the more important to recall in that if there isn't Freud to designate like that, a certain tone, if there isn't Freud something revolutionary, I already warned about this excessive use of this word, but it is certain that if there was a moment when Freud was revolutionary, it is in the measure that he put in the foreground a function which is also the one. It is not the only common element, moreover, which is also this element that Marx contributed, namely to consider a number of facts as symptoms. The dimension of the symptom is that it speaks. It speaks to those who do not know how to hear. It does not say everything, even to those who know it. This promotion of the symptom, sorry, the symptom <laughs> is, is uh, the turning point that we are living through in a certain register, which, let us say, was pursued rumbling quietly, quietly throughout the centuries around the theme of knowledge. It cannot all the same be said that from the point of view of knowledge, we are completely lacking. And we clearly sense what is outmoded in the theory of knowledge when it is a matter of explaining the order of a process constituted by the formulations of science. Physical science gives, gives models of, of it today. The fact that we are in parallel to this revolution of science in a position that one can qualify as being on the path of a certain truth is what shows a certain heterogeneity of status between the two registers. Except for the fact that in my teaching and only there, an attempt is made to show their coherence, which is not obvious, or which is not obvious for those who in this practice of analysis go on about the semblance. Okay, so hold, it, on, hold on for one sec. So <clears throat> this kind of is reiterating what I was just mentioning a moment ago, which is the, only the discourse of the analysis, of the analyst rather, um, is capable of, so to speak, of uh, demonstrating the, the way that a discourse produces a semblance. So that's, okay, so that's very significant. Um, was everybody clear on these points that he made about Freud and Marx? and science, right? Is there any kind of lingering questions? I, I think I'm, I'm clear on, on what he means by all of that. Um, 
me, he's talking about the way that the dimension of a symptom um, produces effects which uh, affect a subject irrespective, like affects a subject at the level of structure, right? Um, and so Freud marks are simply names who identify certain logics of, of how symptoms are produced within specific discourses. Um, but the interesting thing for Marx is what discourse is he talking about for Marx? I'm assuming that he's talking about the discourse of the hysteric. Would you all agree with that? Or is he... Would he be, would he be talking about the capitalist discourse? Or is that something that comes later, is it? Uh, no, 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 no. I think actually, no, no, no. In Seminar 17, you'll remember that he, Lacan says that um, the proletariat, Marx's discourse, is the modern discourse of the his, of hysteria. Right, okay, fair enough. Right? It, 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 the workers' movement, worldview Marxism, the classic uh, utopian socialist glorious project of 19th century European worker movements uh, was the discourse of the hysteric for Lacan, right? And Marx is its great prophet. That's one contribution of Marx. The other contribution of Marx is this whole business about um, not necessarily being the founder of the capitalist discourse, but being the founder of a particular form of symptom which is produced in the discourse of, of the capitalist related to this logic of surplus, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, actually. I like what he said about facts. He said, you know, the whole idea of the symptom can't be spoken wholly. Yeah. Um, does that relate to fact? Facts can't be spoken wholly either. The way yeah. sort of Marx talks about it, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, I think um, we're all okay. Go ahead. I was just going to speculate on. Um, it seems to me here he's stressing the disjunction um, between science on the one hand, insofar as it increasingly attains the real. Yes, it increasingly formalizes it, um, but at the same time, it disavows truth. Um, which is precisely what's at stake in psychoanalysis, truth being always the void of structure, as Lacan defines it, or the truth of incompleteness. Um, and yet at the same time, and what is Lacan also saying, that there's a certain coherence here between, between these two. Yes? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think that's very nice. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 because... Um, semblant is required in the in the in the very it's it's nice that you use the concept of void because miller will make a nice point that each time semblant is invoked you could think about it from the standpoint as there's no there's no theory in psychoanalysis of a pure theory of the void there's no void as such there's only void with semblance right and that actually is tied to a more complex point about the way that signifiers operate within reality and so on, right? But because of that, um, yeah, like I think I think I think you're, you're saying something quite nice. But science is a discourse which doesn't um, need that uh, because its formalization is different. So I should, I should qualify it. I said disavow the real. It in fact forecloses it. It's religion which disavows it. Mm. I, not the real truth, I mean. Oh, I see. Oh, I thought you said science. No, no, yes. Science, I, 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 when I said earlier that science disavows the truth, I, I should correct that and say that technically it forecloses it. And that's religion okay. that disavows truth. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes, I think that that tracks. I remember thinking of something similar that he says about the logic of religion in seminar, uh, in the seminar on ethics, yeah, yeah. Okay. Danny, Mark I wanted to pick up on something that you said about the semblant and void. Um, yeah. And I know Greg also, like, hi, like I read the the piece that on the lacan.org or whatever, and I was wondering, like, how this is inscribed on the body in some meaningful way. Because Lacan here, at, 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 at somewhere in the seminar, I can't pick out the page, but he claims that, the, 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 that it's absurd that the phallus would be considered a, a, an emptiness or a, a lack or a void. So where is the semblant 
with relationship to either, I guess, the Oedipal complex, which he also kind of like puts down at various points, and how would it relate to just its inscription on the body? Is it inscribed in the body in any sort of meaningful way? And how, where is the body in this, I guess, is my question. And that's for everyone, but also Daniel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May I take a crack? Yeah, please, Frank, yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. I'm kind of thinking about that too. And, and I wonder if, um, where is the body with respect to the semblant um, might lead us also to maybe think about the unary trait um, when the body becomes sort of the unary trait uh, and treating the body as the count as one. And I think, you know, maybe just an empirical example of how that gets played out or mobilized is when the body itself starts to be used as sort of tracking its height and you mark yourself with a pencil as you get older and taller, that's, uh, you know, the body's being used as a count as one. And I think it's not where is the body with respect to the semblant, but perhaps the body is the inaugural semblant once it's becoming, or once it has become the count as one in that fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that a lot, Frank. I think also that we should remember to keep in mind that um, our deployment of this concept of the semblant mm -hmm. is um, ubiquitous, right? So yeah. if we talk about the body in Lacan, we're talking about the register of the imaginary. Absolutely. And there is a way in which the instantiation of a signifier of the imaginary um, kind of has the, the structure of semblance, right? Because going back to the point about Bentham and the theory of fictions, if we just keep in mind every time we hear the term semblant fiction, I think that really helps qualify something very nice. Number one. Number two, if we keep in mind uh, that uh, he's actually uh, expanding the, the the kind of wherewithal of the application of this concept at this point because he's making a pivot to a clinic of the real right so he's speaking of the semblant no longer purely as this very specific um uh you know notion of the symbolic and its kind of mediation with the real and things of this nature he's now um thinking about the semblance uh in such a way almost that he wishes to um, find a way to uh, not be determined by it or find, find out if there is a discourse which is not determined by it, that, oh, might, right. not be, that might not be um, uh, constitutive of the semblance in a certain way, right? Number one, on, and then on the other hand, um, it's I think also significant that um, for the subject's perception, um, uh, there is something uh, uh, of the real, which even of the real um, can only be kind of handled through the creation of a semblance as well. So how that relates to the body is a really interesting question precisely because um, as you probably know, one of the really complicated gestures that Lacan does in his later years, which we probably in truth be told haven't caught up with fully, is that he moves beyond Freud's unconscious and he develops a new theory of the unconscious, um, uh, an un uh, what's called the real unconscious, right? And um, um, all of that is theorized or is built upon a new understanding of the, of the parlette of the speaking body, right? So all I'm saying is that um, it's a great question and it, it's, it's, um, it's something we should track, you know, it's, it's something we should track. Yeah, and, and I think also apropos of the imaginary and for Lacan, the body is what precipitates the imaginary and at the same time is the side of the imaginary because I, I, this is where I'm just a Kantian. I think also for Lacan, the imaginary is not just the house of fantasy or dream or memory. It, it does have that in picture thinking, so on and so forth, but it is also the side of affects and it is the sensorium so the body is, I think, at play, especially with respect to the semblant. Uh, but you're right, the semblant is nonetheless irreducible to the body, uh, but th there is a sort of maybe frictionous or fractious relation between the two that is, um, well, I don't know really what to say beyond that, but. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. The a bit about Kant, uh, Frank, I think is perspicuous here because I think it is in the seminar, yes, Chiesa talks about it a bit. Let 
Lacan does, of course, Lacan has a certain idea about intuition. That first intuition is a, uh, you know, um, he, he, he deploys two distinct senses of intuition. One is a older, more traditional sense that, um, that of the world aligning with the intuition, the specious intuition of a, you know, um, integrated bodily totality. And then there's the later notion of intuition that he says is adumbrated in um, Euclid's proof involving the isosceles triangle, um, which is the intuition of the real, of incompleteness. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how to develop it from there, but yes, there's definitely something there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a nice point in Chiesa where he shows that Seminar 18 is so important precisely because we're faced with the first real contradiction in Lacan's very famous, there is no sexual relation, that, that kind of statement, mantra, whatever, around a fundamental ambiguity, whether, um, and this is, I think, a beautiful point for all of us, uh, this proposal of Lacan is actually something about a hyper historicized modification in the discourse on science, or whether going back to Aristotle, there's something fundamental in the logic, like the, the, the whole uh, logicist project from the Greeks on through Frege that uh, understood this notion of phallic incompleteness as an intrinsic part of logic itself. So there's a fundamental, um, you can choose one way or the other in a certain sense, and Chiesa really points that out nicely and really shows that it's a limitation of Lacan in, in a certain sense, uh, or, or kind of an open question, rather. Well, we're actually going to get to that if we stop uh, chatting. We probably should. Um, there's also an incredible, uh, apropos John's uh, comment just a second ago, if you read Sumik's wonderful article in Umbra, which I hope you all do, there's, there's an incredible quote uh, from Freud where he says, um, there are no indications of reality in the unconscious. So one cannot distinguish between the truth and fiction when it is cathected with an affect. There's no indications of reality in the unconscious. Therefore, one cannot distinguish between truth and fiction when it is cathected with an affect. I think this really shows it right there, like the two sides of the semblant right there. Um, it, in other words, for psychoanalysis, truth and fiction are in strict, like, the, you know what I'm saying? They're bound up. And, and to me, as a, like, as a philosopher, this is like why philosophy is, or why psychoanalysis is an anti-philosophy <laughs> in a certain way. Like, because only psychoanalysis can give this very, frustrating point in a certain way. Which is why in Griggs article, he says semblant is a psychoanalytic concept, right? It's not a philosophical concept, right? But it terrorizes the philosopher nonetheless. Okay. Shall we continue? Yeah. I said a second thing. Semblance is not only located, essential to designate the primary function of truth. It is impossible without this reference to qualify what is involved in discourse. What defines discourse, this, this at least is the way I tried to last year give some weight to the term by defining four of them, whose title I was only able to recall last time, to hastily recall at which point certain people found that they were out of their depth. What is to be done? I'm not going to go through, even rapidly, an account of what is involved, even though, of course, I will have to come back to it to show what is involved in it. I pointed out, I pointed out that you could refer in the, the answers described as radiophonic uh, in the last, how do you pronounce that word? Silicet. So yeah. what is involved in them? In what there, there consists this function of discourse, as I announced it last year. It is supported by four privileged places among which, sorry, 
which one gives precisely un remain unnamed, and precisely the one which gives the title of each of these discourses by the function of its occupant. It is when the master signifier is at a certain place that I speak about the discourse of the master, when a certain knowledge also occupies it. I speak of that of the university. Sorry, can you go back a little bit? Go, sorry. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. My, when my the bad. subject in its division, uh, in its division, fundamental for the unconscious is in place. There I speak about the discourse of the hysteric. And finally, when surplus and uh, in surplus enjoying occupies it, I speak about the discourse of the analyst. This place, which in a way is sensitive, that of the top left, for those who were, who were there who, and who still remember this place, which is here occupied in the discourse of the master by the signifier as master S1. This place still not designated, I'm designated, designating by its name, by the name that it deserves. It is very precisely the place of the semblance. This shows, after what I stated the last time, the degree to which the signifier, as I might say, is here at its place. Hence, the success of the discourse of the master, the success all the same that makes it worthwhile to pay attention to it for an instant, because after all, who can believe that any master ever ruled by force? As a question, especially at the start, because after, after all, as Hegel reminds us in this admirable sleight of hand, one man is worth another. And if the discourse of the master gives the basis, the structure, the strong point around which all, several civilizations are organized, it is indeed because its mainspring is all the same of a different order of violence. This does not mean that we are in any way sure that in these facts, which it must be said, we can only articulate with the most extreme caution, that once we pinpoint them by some term or, or other as primitive, pre-logical, archaic, and anything whatsoever of whatever order it may be, archaic, arche, are the beginning, why? And why would this not also be a waste product, these primitive societies? But nothing settles it. What is certain is that they show us that it is not necessary for, the, for things to be established in function of the discourse of the master. First of all, the mytho-ritual configuration, which is the best way of pinpointing them, does not necessarily imply the articulation of the discourse of the master. Nevertheless, it must be said it is certain it is a certain form of alibi to interest ourselves so much in what is not the discourse of the master, in most of it is a way of confusing things completely. While you busy yourself with that, you are not, you are not looking for something else. And nevertheless, the discourse of the master is an essential articulation. And the way I expressed it ought to be something that some people, I'm not saying everyone, some people should try to get their heads around. Because what is at stake, and this I also clearly stressed the last time, what is at stake Anything new that can happen and is called, I have always said it, insisting on the temp tempering that should be applied to it, because what is called revolutionary can only consist in a change, in a displacement of discourse, namely each of these places. I would like, in a way, to give an image, but you know the sort of retinizing that an image can lead to, to represent to represent um, by what one might call four bolts, each of which would have its name. The way that into these bolts, there slide a certain number of terms, specifically what I distinguish between S1 and S2, insofar at the point that we are at, S2 constitutes a certain body of knowledge. The O, insofar as it, directly, as it is directly a consequence of the discourse of the master, the split subject, the S, how, uh, what would you call, call that term? The, this, um, the subject? The, 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 the that sign, we, we call it. The, that's the subject sign. Which one are you at? Uh, after the master, that, yeah. What you uh, just. Oh, oh that, the, subject. The, the, the split subject. Split subject. Split subject, yeah. The split so, subject. The divided, which, the divided subject, yeah. Divided subject. We'll just get into, you know, the symbol. So I just, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, the subject, which in the discourse of the master occupies this place which is a place that we are going to talk about today, that for its part, I have already named, which is that of the truth. Truth 
is not contrary of semblance. The truth, as I might say it, is this dimension or this dimension, if you will, allow me to make up a new word, to designate these bowls. Yes, yeah, so make up at least one new word every seminar as a rule. It just wouldn't be look on if we didn't have one new word. He's the <laughs> neology is a master. It's, it's, it's good stuff. I think, I think sometimes he can make up three in one day. I mean, it's like maybe four, but he's very- and why not? And why not? We yeah, should, we like, should, we should, we applaud the man for this, I think, personally. Yeah, of <laughs> uh, just real quick, could we read uh, D. Monchon? This might be stupid, but as uh, commenting on Freud's comment about how the the mass the, um, the ego is not mastering its own home, like this oh, is like yeah. the demon yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. That <laughs> is nice. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that's nice. I uh, I was just thinking that the 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 primary. Um, uh, modification of dimension is to yeah to to human in a sense humanize it because you make a reference to like something distinct to humans as you, you see what i mean that like truth is of the status distinct for man for the speaking being or something so man mansion would be i, I don't know but you, you you probably that's a much more clever observation kid that, that is a really clever observation because de Mancion is, I think, the French. It's like, he's, of course, making up a word, but Mancion is French for house. So, yeah. like, de Mancion is to sort of, you know, de house, which what he's getting at is unhandliche, right? It's the uncanny, being at home or being not at home in homeness. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that I think is a great interpretation. Yeah. Um, Kate, great job. That also links up with the earlier des. Uni this universe, yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure, for sure, yeah, yeah, very nice. All right, we should carry on, yes, please. All right, I'm going to read that again because I like it. All right, so, uh, truth is not the contrary of semblance, the truth, as I might say it is this dimension or this dimension, if you will allow me to make up a new word, to designate these bowls, this dimension, which is strictly correlative to that of the semblance. This dimension, I told you that the latter, that of the semblance supports it. So then something is indicated all the same about what this semblance is getting at. It is clear that there is a question that is a little inexact. I mean, the one that came back came back to me along, uh, along quite in direct paths. Two young sages whom I greet if they are here again today. I hope they will not be offended that they were overheard in passing, gravely nodding their heads, it appears, asking one another, is he a dangerous idealist? Am I a, da am I a dangerous idealist? <laughs> that, that, that seems to me to be completely uh, beside the point. Because I, be I began, and with that em and one emphasis, I would say that I would I said that the opposite of what exactly I wanted to say. By putting the emphasis on the fact that discourse is an artifact. What I am initiating with that is exactly the contrary, because the semblance is the contrary of an artifact. As I pointed out, semblances flourish in nature. The question, once knowledge is no longer at stake. Once we no longer believe that it is along the path of perception from which we are supposed to extract some quintessence or other, that we know something by means of an apparatus, which is discourse, there is no longer any question of the idea. Mm. First time, moreover, that the idea makes its appearance, it was little better positioned than after the exploits of Bishop Berkeley. It was Plato who was involved. And he asked himself, where was the real of what was called a horse? His, uh, his idea of the idea was the importance of this naming. <clears throat> Let's get into that nominalism stuff now. In this, in this multiple and transitory thing, which was moreover perfectly obscure in his epoch, more than in ours, is not the whole reality of a horse in this idea, insofar as that means the signifier, a horse. You must not believe that because Aristotle put, this, uh, put, put the emphasis of reality on the individual, 
that he got any further. The individual means exactly what one cannot say. And precisely at a certain point, if Aristotle had not been the marvelous logician that he was, who took the unique step, the decisive step, thanks to which we have a reference point about what an articulated sequence of signifiers is, one could say that in his, his way of highlighting what usia is, in other words, the real, he behaves like a mystic. What is proper to usia, he says, to, he says it himself is that it cannot in any way be attributed. It is not sayable. What is not sayable is precisely what is mystical. I like that. I say, I'm going to like that. But yeah, that's, that's, that's it's getting really interesting now. Only it appears he is not of that opinion, but he leaves the place to the mystic. It is obvious that the solution to the question of the idea could come to play could not come to Plato. It is from the angle of the function and of the variable that all of that finds its solution. May if it I, is yes, sure. Sorry, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that like passage, and it feels very important. And so, I this is me exercising privilege, I suppose, of escansion. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so. First off, I guess we should circle back to the very end of the previous paragraph. What is no longer, this is kind of ambiguous. I wasn't entirely clear on the, you know, amidst Lacan shift in grammar, there is no longer, for instance, when he says there is no longer any question of the idea, what is the idea he's referring to? Well, what I was, what I, 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 I was getting from it is, seems to be making this idea of the question of the idea as being related to perception. And obviously from the yeah. position of the analyst, there's this idea of, well, we're not really interested wholly at that intuitive grasp of, of, of perception phenomenology per se. It's, it's a question of taking things back uh, to structure and playing around with the, the fundamental incompleteness of that structure. But in, <laughs> That's that's what I got from it, and I could be. He's also he's also he's also criticizing um, a certain form of empiricism, which would locate ideas qua individual perception. Mm -hmm. But once we abandon the path of perception, and we recognize that the what we can speak of truth and knowledge and so on is an effect of discourse, we've left idealism, right? We've left idealism. In, in, that sense, saying, yeah. in that sense, precisely because I've invented the discourses, I'm not an idealist, right? Um, so that's one point. And then he's going to talk about Bishop Barclay, Aristotle, and Plato, and show that um, there was a, a something arrogated precisely, something unsaid about the status of substance or essence in Aristotle, which um uh would later be um logically taken up through the through the process of function right so there's a kind of um unsayable dimension dimension um within discourse which um okay for religion it's unsayable for wittgenstein it's unsayable for some philosophers it's unsayable um but you have logic and so he's kind of going in that direction. And I think he's also saying that, um, uh, although he's not kind of putting a finer point on it, because it must be that the people asking him this are Marxists. And so they're thinking about the distinction between materialism and idealism in a very Marxian way. And so uh, it's very ironic because someone like Baju would still, I think, submit, I know he does, to the notion that Lacan's theory of the discourses is a form of idealism, actually, even though he's saying that it's not. So I wonder what others think about that. Like, there's sort of a debate about this, like the status of idealism. What about the, the what about the, the materiality of the signifier as well? So it's there's always that aspect of of bringing yeah. it back away it, it, for Lacan the uh, the the intrinsic fact that uh, he wants to talk about how 
you know, an analysis uh, can be a discourse that isn't a semblance, is, is the fact that the materiality of the signifier is always interrupting it on some level. And in this sense, he's not an idealist because yeah. that level of material, materiality or of the signifier is always interrupting stuff. Sorry. Stuff. Yeah, that's good. A very unsophisticated way of saying it. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> what, what do others think about this? It brings oh. up a little bit, oh, sorry, the, the Hegel line that I think Terry Pinkard quotes sometimes um, about how uh, animals are the truest idealists because they just like take the fruit straight from the tree. So talking about how semblances flourish in nature compared to the artifact of discourse, which I, I, I'm taking to be then that semblance just on its own, and I, I love correction here, is, is seen more on the side of idealism and that the interrogation of then the artifact of discourse, that's um, the apparatus which replaces that of perception of which would be, I guess, perceptions of semblances of nature is what he says removes him from idealism through this punning of taking it outside of any question of idea, which I'm almost seeing his interpretation of Plato being like this like sublimation of semblances uh, in nature to absolute forms or something like that. Mm, mm, mm. I would caution. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I may have misheard some of that, Kate, but um, so it seemed to me that like w when he talks about the apparatus of discourse proceeding, I, I think he there means actually semblance because after all, he talks about science proceeding by way of semblances and you know, precisely puncturing semblances. I, I don't know, maybe it, it, this, this might be linked to some of my lungs of my still standing confusion as to what he really means by artifact, um, which hasn't been at all clear to me. Um, yeah, that, that's part of what threw me off at the end of that yeah, last paragraph. Again, the idea of like, the, Daniel, your idea that's empiricism he's refuting is very like, uh, that's no, 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 no. Um, there was one other thing I was going to count on, um, comments on, I don't know if this is um, crazy. I don't, I don't think it's only empiricism. I think okay. he's, he's talking about a, a multiplicity of idealism. So anyways. Okay. Multiple um, forms of idealism. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say this business about uh, Aristotle and Lucia that cannot yeah. in any way acquire an attribute, a predicate. In fact, this is um, tremendously um, reminiscent of how well, Lacan, of course, defines the A object is uh, via. Uh, a, a, in the seminar on identification, he draws from um, Kant's uh, nihil negativum, the object without a concept. Lear Gegenstand ohne Begriff, yes. Um, and so, yes, I, I, I think he's, it, this come, goes back to like the question of whether the Greeks were, you know, perhaps tacitly at some level where some level will infl uh, you know, influenced, impacted by the, inc the incompleteness of language. Yeah, yeah. Can we scroll up to the, the overlapping pages? It's just where he has that line about, um, okay, what I am initiating with that is exactly the contrary because the semblance is the contrary of an artifact which which just to air in your your first point because that was throwing me a little bit too because you had all this identification of semblance or signifier it's the signifier in itself but then at the same time the, the artifact of discourse is at the contrary of semblance and the pun that's been ringing in my head since last week for artifact because there's some overlap with the French and Lacan uses English here and there is like when he was had had certain lines about how a discourse almost like proves itself in a certain way or like it establishes itself by being a discourse I was taking this to be like discourse being the art of fact like of, of making fact um, through discourse, and this is how I was reading it as being contrary to semblance here in a certain way. But that's the etymology of the word artifact is to make as well. If you go look at the etymology of the term, so first, you know, I think that there's, you're, you're onto something uh, definitely. I mean, this is my. So, 
He it's mentions reminded. artifact in relation to two examples of semblance. One is, remember, the blood and the sawdust on the ground. And he talks about the blood as the artifact. And the other one was with, um, um, what was it, with the thunder? And so there's kind of like these two dimensions of um, the happening and they sort of split and there's kind of like a, um, a remainder. And so there's like the artifact I was thinking was this kind of um, that which uh, remains kind of inert or something like that, or which itself can only be taken up as semblance, uh, something like that. But I don't, I'm not clear on it either, actually. But I, but I will say one thing is that Chiesa does have a nice um, reference to the use of artifact if we refer to his text. And I'm going to pull up uh, where he references it because I remember reading it and he clarified it for me. Well, I mean, I think it's that an artifact in a Spinoza sense is a dead you know, object. It doesn't mean, it doesn't usher forward. Whereas like in Mount Sinai, the thunder, you know, it, it ushers forward something, you just don't know what. Yeah. The whole idea of what he's referring to the, the thunder, you know, is we don't know what. Unlike, say, Theodore Reich's or Theodore Reich's analysis of uh, the, the whole story of Mount Sinai, the classical Freudian analysis is it, is it might mean this or that. There's many ways to read it. But what Lacan is doing is it doesn't matter exactly what it may mean. It's just that it's a semblance. It means a lot. We just don't know what. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's got this tremendous evocation. So that's what a semblance really is. So an artifact could be a semblance. You know, we don't, it, it could have, like, for example, let's say the January 6th, 6th the, you know, uh, rushing into the Capitol. Uh, when they put the hangman thing in front before they went into the, the, uh, the, the Capitol, that would be a semblance. But now a video that nobody wants to look at of those guys talking to each other before they are rushed in there, that would be an artifact. That's exactly well, what I was It's a question of immediacy, That's right. isn't That's it? Right. It's a question of immediacy. Right. Now, well, if so they started to get together and we all got afraid that they're going to do some weird thing, that might then be, yes. and we saw the video again, that might then operate as a semblance. So, so that's actually really interesting apropos what he says about um, the sublimation of matchboxes, which is like, that whole distinction, it kind of evokes that same thing, which is, you know, like the best definition of sublimation is taking some artifact, some dumb, ordinary matchbook, but then hanging it up on your wall as if it's a painting, right? Right. And that's elevating the object to a status of a thing or the dimension of a thing. But it's like the same thing with like, I don't know, like a flag that was used in a war to, to rally the troops then you put it on your wall, it's an artifact. It's not a semblance, right? It's not caught up within a discursive operation or something, right? So that's how I'm thinking the distinction. But Cade, let's go back to you. Is that, are you still, uh, is that at all helpful or where are you at with this now? Well, yeah, cause I was, I was thinking about like what makes them contraries, but then um, I think it was Andrew talking. Um, because like, yeah. I was thinking, he's, when you identified them, I like thinking like, well, we're in a dialectical space, so you can have something that is its contrary, I guess, somewhat here, um, and and that that was I, I, an effective example, I think, uh, to even maybe show how that could be dialectically involved. But I still feel like in this passage, there's something of a rigid line being put out um, between Lacan's methodology and then this sort of like attempt at a dual takedown of the Greek through both Plato and Aristotle when he says, you know, Aristotle doesn't get much further. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, it seems like there, I feel like there is still something of a distinction with the, the interaction with artifact and discourse as opposed to perception and semblance, even though those, they, there might be intertwining points. I just want to add one thing about the whole thing about nature thing when he keeps on re-evoking re because if you just a little bit, it's a little bit of an acid sort of psychedelic thought here. If you think about the birds in the morning when they're sort of going crazy at each other and why that's all kind of semblance. If you think about it, they're just ushering to each other out in a kind of crazy, noisy way that it's, it's the morning, it's the morning, it's the morning. They're just announcing like in this, as we could say, semblance. It has no real 
way to really announce anything particular specifically that one could say is really discourse that this something specifically is happening here. Right. It's just an announcement of some kind of phenomena, but we don't know what. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. I like that. To, to accentuate that point, Andrew, I mentioned last week, um, uh, Summer Tomsic talks a little bit a little bit about semblance and the capitalist unconscious. And there he draws the distinction between semblance and nature and semblance as promoted, as um, produced by discourse. And the integral difference being that discourse, the signifier introduces difference. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, which precisely makes it something determinate, makes it something particular. I mean, that's the way a signifier signifies something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I mean, what are they um, signifying, if not for the distinction between night and the morning? <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. I also uh, just. But last... that's different from, I think, Aaron, from your what you say difference. Right. This is a clear differentiation. That I... the animals are are they making that distinction? I, Lacan has all these curious points, as for instance, towards the end of the last session, where he's talking about, um, you know, something like signifiers in nature. I mean, he referred to this a few times in the last session, but he makes a distinction. He says somewhere towards the end, at the unconscious, we cannot take as, you know, evidencing its own structure prior to itself that what's at stake in the unconscious is the emergence of the function of the signifier, which up until then functioned as a token, but something like the line. And that token reference is very interesting because it goes back to something he talks about towards the beginning of seminar six <laughs> with regards to instincts. And he has this weird analogy involving like circuit boards or pinball machines. I can't remember exactly, but like he, he's counterposing. <coughs> The, the operations of like signs in nature as being token-like and the tokens as they function, you know, for the speaking animal. So I can't help but also read in this a couple more complicated, uh, I don't know, procedures to think this through. On the one hand, the way I read semblance is that it's a function of difference. Something resembles another thing. So in that regard, it seems to me I can't help but think of how Lacan talks to his audience in seminar 17, um, especially with regard to signifiers in discourse and how they relate and how those discourse or those discursive relations, the relationship between a signifier and a discourse produces a meaning effect that implicates the subject. So for example, let's say we have horse. There's the horse, the animal, but then there's horse, the signifier. If I am in the discourse of gymnastics and someone says horse, I'm probably gonna go and look at the horse as the gymnastic apparatus. But if I'm on the rodeo and some, someone says horse, I'm gonna go and look for an actual horse, an animal. So it's as if Lacan is really getting at a Hegelian point here, which is that difference is in the sameness, right? That resemblance or semblant is a function of difference, but that difference really is, it makes all the difference of when one can talk about the same thing. For example, in the US, democracy might mean, somebody, mean something to someone different than if you were to say democracy, say, in, I don't know, 1932, you know, Soviet Russia. Um, that's how I'm reading this, is that semblance is really the way in which the signifier plays with sameness and difference in a certain kind of, I guess, life containment. It relates to language games as well, and Wittgensteinian language games meaning is, is use. So there's the semblance yeah. related to, is, is related to, to, could be related to that. And so far the semblance, is but even Wittgenstein, I mean, he goes so far as to say it's not just use, but that context and meaning are simultaneous, but definitely an awkward correlation to each other, too. That mm -hmm. there's an asymmetry, right? And, and that would probably, you know, point up the slippage of a signifier. Um, I think we should keep on reading this section on nominalism and then maybe come back to this stuff because, you know, he says these things about um, the variable and the function, and Aristotle and all of that but he will come back, he will repeat and go back over that ground. So maybe we could keep this and retain this and 
move to this section because there's I just I just want to make sure that we get to the um, Hitler's mustache section if this seminar before the end of tonight. So, okay. All right. I'm going to read from uh, it is from the angle of the function. All right. So that's where we're at. Okay. Uh, okay. It is from the angle of the function and of the variable that all of that finds its solution. If it is clear that if there is something that I am, it is not a nominalist. I mean that I do not start from the fact that the name is something that is stuck like that onto the real. And you have to choose. If one is a nominalist, one must completely renounce dialectical materialism. So that, in short, the nominalist tradition, which is properly speaking, the only danger of idealism that can be put forward here in a discourse like mine, is very obviously rejected. It is not a matter of being realist in the sense that the people were in the Middle Ages, the realism of universals, but it is a matter of designating, of highlighting the fact that our discourse, our scientific discourse, only discovers the real because of the fact that it depends on the function of the semblance. The effects of what I call algebraic articulations of the semblance, and as such, it is only letters that are at stake, is the only system by means of which we designate what is real. What is real is what makes whole, makes a whole in this semblance. In this articulated semblance, which is scientific discourse, scientific discourse progresses without even asking itself anymore whether or not it is a semblance. It is simply a question of whether its network, its net, its lattice, as they say, makes the holes appear in the right place. The only reference is the impossible at which these deductions culminate. This impossible is the real. The apparatus of discourse, insofar as it is what in its rigor encounters the limits of its consistency, it is with this that we aim in physics at something that is real. What is important for us and what concerns us, namely the field of truth, and why it is the field of truth only qualified as such that concerns us, I am going to try to articulate today. In what concerns us, we are dealing with something that takes into account that it differs from this position of the real in physics. This something that resists, that is not permeable to every meaning, which is a consequence of our discourse, and which is called fantasy. And what has to be tested are its limits, its structure, the function, the relationship in a discourse of one of the terms of the, oh, is that is it the is a zero? Should we, what, 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 what symbol should we call this? Oh, because I know we talked about the object. It's O. It's O. He usually calls the object R like the O object. Or oh, object. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's O object. I thought, yeah, I'm, this is yeah, uh, right. yeah. the surplus enjoying the. The, the 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 subject the split subject of the subject or precisely the point which is broken or on poo in the discourse of the master this is what we have to test to its function in its functioning when in the completely opposite position that's so hold on. can i say one quick thing yeah. uh, somebody said a moment ago that aristotle's innovation of logic of not um leaving the real to the mystics, but um, quantifying it through logic, right? That that Lacan can use algebra. He can use these kind of math. He can he can say, let's say, he can use formalization. But it's not ex it's it's the real that is capable of being formalized, which is the effect of a signifier. But if, as I said before, that at this stage the kind of um, harmony between signifier and real is, is um, has a non-rapport relation, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, I... To, me, to me, that means that this is a different, uh, a different he, he's given us a different theory of the real in relation what? to science. So it, we bring it, it into different, that. Different compared to like all of the, that he's taught before. Right. So, I mean, my, my own perspective is, so, Going back to talking about what he's talking about, the mystic, if you go back in like the sixth century and you know the desert fathers, 
there's this tradition of mysticism is about silence. You don't formalize it. You sit in a desert and you shut up and you don't leave your cell, all right? And it's later on, you know, through the centuries, around the 16th century, that you find a formalization of mysticism where the unsayable is essentially sayable. Uh -huh. You know, and it becomes pretty much the purview of, of, of women as well, because they're sort of right up against this, the, the, the patriarchal structure of the Catholic Church. So there is this couching of language and formalization of the unsayable and yeah. constant playing and throwing around with meaning. And when you see what he's doing with psychoanalysis, well, what he's doing with, with this per se is he's doing it again, this way of finding different structural places of, 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 of playing with the unsayable, you know, bringing it into mathematics, playing with science, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that so where it, if you look in the you know the sixth century the mystics didn't, didn't say anything they just sat in a desert people spoke about them you know these are great people who we go and see and be inspired by then right. later on throughout the history you've got this formalization of mysticism you know mm -hmm. through this sort of perversion of theology and this this playing around of structure of logic and you know you look at julian of norwich you look at john of the cross you look at all these they take bits and pieces of these these um theological discourses and play around with them but it's not it's not an it's not a silence it's not a silent unsayableness <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of talking about unsayableness constantly and so with Lacan you've got it again he's taken these discourses and science and and you know um truth is it, it played up as a constant disruptive factor something that's necessary for discourse to exist but it, what? it's not related to discourse as a product it's yeah it, it's um I don't, it, well, it's that thing of constant moving of, of trying to find ways of talking about the unsayable right? yeah that's true yeah it's not just silence i mean that's actually the thing with theology and lacan which is like gabriel was saying a few days ago you know um this enigmatic place that's that's held open by object ah it's not true that theology has nothing to say. No, on the contrary, like there's whole traditions of elaborations mm -hmm. on this precise space. Okay, psychoanalysis can formalize it and, and, and locate it from the position of discourse of analyst, but theology kind of does the same thing. In other words, maybe theology, I don't know if you would agree, is itself like a form of a discourse of the analyst in a way, um, is what I hear you saying. I would say so, so aspects of theology, especially with Thomas Aquinas and right. you know, the use of Aristotle. I would, I'd put in the discourse of the university myself, but this is, but you know, with with um, you know, so sort of mis the mystical, it was always this constant disruption and perversion and playing around with the university discourse. It was yeah. sort of on this yeah, yeah. The, playing with the boundary and it, it was done that for very political reasons because if these mystics these came out and said oh i'm i'm speaking from the position of the church they'd be burned at the stake you know <laughs> it's it's uh so it was always well, this constant say, poetic well, playing well, around with it and you know that was a way of protecting yeah, yeah. themselves the discourse of the university wouldn't know what the fuck to do with mysticism like they, they have not they have nothing to say there so like they're, they're no good for that like which is why like Sometimes that's why why Zizek, when he came to America for the first time, <laughs> the only places that welcomed him were the theology departments. <laughs> we should. Can I just the clarify the sciences, something, you know, <laughs> Mark? You yes. you were bringing uh, uh, you were uh, uh, finding an, an analog in history for the two versions of the real that Daniel was pointing out. Is that right? Is that what you were doing? I think so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so back to Daniel, why does it make sense to say that? That, 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 that here we have a whole new theory of the real? I mean, uh, how, how does it not, I mean, it, I understand that it, it makes sense, I, I, but I don't, I don't how think is it? Saying, I don't think he's saying that. It's just, it's just simply a new vantage point. He, he's just simply saying, like he says in television, like uh, I've simply made my name by, um, pioneering the discourse that Freud opened by, by remaining true to the discourse of the analyst. It's just, it's just he, he's just speaking from the perch of the analyst in a certain way. Like, I don't, that's the novelty that I see there. Um, he's giving different term, terminological contributions to locate things, but other thinkers and philosophers have also been able to pinpoint 
I think that's what Mark is saying, that in theology, you can, you can superimpose the Lacanian conceptual apparatus, which is beneficial because it's a very robust apparatus, right? Um, and so you can sort of superimpose it really easily onto o- older theologians or something like that, right? I was, I was, the, I wa- well, I, I, I wanted to clarify, Mark, the, the, you mentioned the role that women began to play for, for the church fathers in, in mystical experience, but it's not clear uh, why then or, or, or how. Uh, was it because they were, they were unlettered? Or, or because they're for, it was, to, yeah, to, yeah, more I mean, in the body. It was pretty. We're talking, we're, we're talking about a specific iteration of of uh, of this. And I'm talking about Catholic theological, you know, yeah, that, that perspective, the medieval church. But there was this relationship where the, these people, these hermits, these these nuns, they they had they a way ready. of speaking. They had a way of speaking that the the, the institutional church was always deeply um, uncomfortable with, but they felt it was this necessary thing because it was incredibly important for, for the community. So there had to be ways of being able to, to deal with that and to, and to have them there. You know, you, there's, there's lots of different movements, you know, especially with the, you know, um, the English mystical tradition, the cloud of unknowing and all those things. But my, my, my point was, is that if you go in the past, there was this very much, oh, there was the, these people in the desert, the desert fathers, sixth century in the Egyptian desert. These are people that don't speak. We're the ones that speak. We're the ones um, that, that speak with authority, with the, the logic of the philosophers. We, 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 we bring Jerusalem to, to Athens, so to speak. But these people in the desert, these are the ones that inspire, inspire us by representing the unsayable. You know, in Lacanian sense, by representative, representing the real, they are the externals in it of, of of what we can talk about. But they don't speak. They literally in in a in a desert of emptiness, not speaking. But then, as as time goes on, this this unsayableness or the desert is brought into discourse. It's brought into theology itself. It's brought into the speaking of things. And you find its final culmination in this, uh, I'd say the biggest is iteration in the 16th century with people like uh, John of the Cross and uh, Teresa of Avila, who come up with these, you know, wonderful ways of, 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 of logically mapping out the interior self with, you know, mm-hmm. with beautiful diagrams, you know, John of the Cross, Mount Carmel, and, and, and um, Teresa of Avila with this, this, this interior castle. And it was always a way of, of trying to reiterate and they mixed and they took the, the philosophy of, of like St. John of the Cross, took the philosophy of Aristotle, took, took the philosophy, you know, Averroes, all these, all these different philosophers, but he mixed them all up together and he didn't stick to one. You know, people, there's been loads of scholars trying to say, oh, this guy's a, um, you know, a nominalist or this guy is, he's, he's a scholastic or this guy is none of those things. He's constantly playing around and playing with language and, you know, trying to sh- demonstrate in this mad poetic discourse of this absolutely unsayable yep. thing that exists in us. And we wanted to, and to me, there's an aspect of that with, 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 with Lacan, you know, this idea of this constant screwing around with language, taking these, these, yeah. these mm-hmm. various discourses so then- and not shutting off about the unsayable, which is extraordinarily missing. One moment, the, then the, 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 let's finish this, that for Lacan also, the mystic, the women are very important as the example of, of, of mystical experience. And, and why is that? And we could talk about for the, for the second iteration of the later uh, church fathers, but, but also for Lacan himself. I think we should well, that's, reference yeah. Encore when we, when we get to that. We should we should look at we should definitely look at encore and I'm happy to to uh, pull up. I'd love to do the encore. I have a specific argument. I, I, I recommend that we go back to this seminar because this paragraph coming up here is a beautiful one on Lacan's theory of racism, and I think it's something worth um, carefully working on together. So that's my suggestion: is that we look at this because this is the famous thing which Zizek always talks about. 
of Hitler's mustache and that, all that bullshit, you know? Um, but you have to, there's some things here that uh, surprised the hell out of me when I, when, I re, when I read it a few times. I think we should, we should look at this. Okay, so uh, where am I? I know I'm here, you're there, but where are we? You're, I think you start here, right? To illuminate what is involved. Okay, in good, 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 all right. <laughs> to illuminate what is involved in where I want to get to, I will go to what I want to, want to mark today about what is involved in analytic theory. Because of this, I'm not coming back. I'm skipping over a function that is expressed in a certain way of speaking that I use here when I address you. Nevertheless, I cannot but draw your attention to the fact that if the last time I challenged you with a term which might have appeared impertinent, and rightly so, to speak of plus de jour, pre a, a, pressure, a pressured surplus enjoying, ought I then speak, talk about about some kind of pressure, pressurized, pressure, pre pressurized. Yeah. Never, I was going to say pressured, but pressurized. Yeah. Nevertheless, this has a meaning, a meaning which is one from which I preserve my discourse. That, in any case, has not the character of what Freud designated as the discourse of the leader. It is indeed at the level of discourse at the beginning of the twen of the of the twenties that Freud articulated in. Mastin Psych, I can't, I'm my, my German's bad if someone else wants to say that, I'm happy to take it, but I'm not, I'm not going to touch that with a barge yeah. pole, but someone else can. Something which curiously was found to be, be at the source of the Nazi phenomenon. And so the schema that he gives in this article at, at the end of the chapter of identification, you will see, see indicated there almost open to, to view the relations between capital I and small o. Truly, the schema seems to be designed for the Lacanian signs to be imposed on it. <clears throat> um, that which in a discourse is addressed to the other as a thou gives rise to an identification to something that one can, can call the human idol. Okay. If, um, if I speak the last time about red blood as being the blood that is most useless to propel against the semblance, it artifact. is indeed... Sorry? Sorry? I said artifact. Yeah, no, I was just, yeah, this is really interesting because other, other than now, this is a reference to Martin Buber, right? My yeah, right yeah, here? true. Yeah. Very true, yeah. Okay, so we're talking about that idle semblance. Right. Interest, you know, this is... Yeah, I will come back. Um, it is indeed because, as you have seen, one cannot advance and overthrow the idol without immediately taking its place. And we know that this is what happened to a certain type of martyr. It is indeed in the measure that something in every discourse that appeals to the thou provokes a camouflaged secret identification, which is only one to this enigmatic object that may seem nothing, the tiny little surplus enjoying of Hitler that went no further perhaps than in his mustache. This was enough to crystallize people who had nothing mystical about them, who were the most committed to the process of the discourse of the capitalist. That's the key point right there. You see mm -hmm. the link to discourse and I'm going to show the math theme of it in a moment, but go on. Do, 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 do you want to talk a little bit here right now? But, uh, I think you should just kind of finish what's highlighted and then we can discuss. Okay. <clears throat> Who were the most committed to the process of the discourse of the capitalist? With what involves in terms of a questioning surplus enjoying in its form of surplus value? It was a matter of seeing whether at a certain level one would still have one's little bit son to keep out. And indeed, this was enough to provoke this effect of identification. <laughs> <laughs> just a little mistake. This is so incredible, man. Yeah. Oh, and then and then he says something very interesting. It is amusing simply that this should have taken the form of an idealization of the race. So he's almost talking about how the discourse of the capitalist intensifies a semblance of race, or like race becomes a semblance or it intensifies it because of the condition, which I'll show you in a moment with the math theme of the discourse of the capitalist, of the relation between um, surplus and join and pressurized surplus joy songs. And mm -hmm. the tension that that produces 
um, he says, it's amusing that this should take the form of an idealization of the race, namely of the thing which on that occasion was least involved in the relation. But one can find where this character of fiction comes from. So he's called, it's a beautiful point, apropos, like writing an article about like capitalism and racism. Here we have it distilled quite nicely. It is where this character of fiction comes from, one can find it. What must be simply said is that there is no need for this ideology for a racism to be constituted and that all that is needed is a surplus in join that mm -hmm. recognizes itself as such and that whoever is a little bit interested in what may happen in the future here he's being prophetic would do well to tell himself that every form of racism insofar as a surplus in join is very well capable of supporting it is now what is on the agenda this is what is in store for us in the years to come See, there is a reason why we study this guy after all, right? Yeah. This is this is very nice, man. It's like I think this is I mean, huge. What, what he's saying is that uh, going looking at the I and thou, this I and Sam, yeah. this yeah, yeah, yeah. linking this to the capitalist discourse, almost as if yeah. within the capitalist discourse, there's nothing other but this direct relationship to the other, which sort of fatalizes this sort of racism or a type of, um, if, if you're locked in an imaginary identification, there's yeah. always going to be antagonism at some level, some accusation of the surplus of enjoyment from the other, which, you know, is your So when he's talking about Hitler's little mustache, this, you know, sort of ridiculous thing that he right. had on his face, this thing that people automatically identify with him, something like that, it's that literal structure which is then projected back onto the other as yeah. the, the other, this this race, this this bunch of people, they have this small thing, the thing that we don't know about that, that they're enjoying. And it's so uh, it's 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 bad and we need to stop it. And you know, the, the structure of racism are actual. I mean, that's that's what I was picking up. Someone jump in if I'm getting it wrong. No, but I don't know. Yeah, just right back to the unary trait in the body, though, where the unary trait suddenly transmutes the body into a, a, a site of identification rather than a collection of fragments. So the mustache ends up turning Hitler into a one that counts the ones for that identity around there. And it becomes a site of enjoyment or, I guess, pressurized enjoying. Um, and it does make me think, too, something that Lillian Ferrari had said at a uh, Apre Coup conference specifically titled Knowledge Semblance and Jouissance um, about the unary trait as it identifies the body as one. Uh, so I, I, again, I think that I, I wanna know more about what is the relation then to the semblance with respect to the body and to the unary trait. And is the unary trait something that is a function that transmutes the body so that it becomes a one so that it's a site of identification that quilts a field of, I mean, in this instance, fascists. Um, and in that regard, also, do we see a, a homologous dynamic at play with the capitalist discourse? I mean, what you see is object A as lack completely disavowed and what takes its place is a semblance that, that is a, forms a veil over the object A. So no longer are objects lost, but they can always be retrieved. So it's, a, it's an economy of semblance. Um, so and it's that level yeah. of pomp as well. This, I don't know, sort of level of, I like, take, for example, you know, the, if you think of Trump or you take it, like the, the point, or even Mussolini, these guys are all ridiculous. There's something about who they are in, in their performance. They have a, you know, Mussolini with his massive chin and Trump with his, his bouffant hair, Hitler with his little mustache. There's this level of pomp and performance, this way of, I don't know, sort of um, accentuating what you're talking about, maybe an of, of the unary trait, this way of being able to embody something. I, 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 it, 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 it's something I've always thought about is how do these guys who are ultimately ridiculous and they have these ridiculous things, but people take them so, so seriously. And even in all their ridiculousness, they're capable of perpetuating such vehemence within you know, with the against the community. And, you know, yeah. this is just something I'm, I was thinking about. But I it's think, this point about little Hitler's mustache. It's really, you know, it's, it's making me think. 
I think the key thing here is remember the maneuver that Lacan is treating the uh, pressurized surplus um, enjoyment, like that's the status of his audience. So if the status of that audience under pressurized surplus enjoying had a self-awareness of that, right? If it wasn't disidentified, because we know that in the Lacanian teaching, identification is a suspect category. He's not speaking from the position of a master where he's trying to evoke a kind of identification. So I think what's really interesting about this is that you sort of have superimposed the master's discourse with the discourse of the capitalist here in fascism. And that when you make that superimposition, you produce racism because what you're producing is you're, 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 you're distributing little bits of this excess, which is, is, is contained in a point of identification on the body. Well, so there's yeah. a correlation between the body of the leader and the body of the masses self-conscious yep. and, and, and enjoying this surplus three sons, which if we know uh, anything about uh, the status of um, pressurized surplus Jewish sons, this is not a pleasurable um, state. This is not a state of a homeostasis of the body. This is a state of, of um, disequilibrium and agitation and, and well, so on. Constant need of catharsis, isn't it? Yeah, it's not exactly anxiety, right? But it's, no. it's effectively charged in, in some mm -hmm. uncomfortable way. So it makes perfect sense that the fascist identification satisfies that not by ameliorating it, but by intensifying it mm -hmm. and finding some kind of point of identification to sustain its to sustain its place. Whereas the discourse of the analyst, super because I think what he's saying is that the dominant discourse is the discourse of capitalist, right? So you have these kind of variations that you can superimpose one onto it. But what remains strong is the discourse of the capitalist, as he says. It's very strange that racism was the effect because the real logic in terms of the placement of the bodies and so on was this relationship between surplus and join and surplus value, which we saw in the math theme going from uh, divided subject product back up. So this Actually, is- Thank you, Daniel. You really yeah. clarified that for me. You know, that was uh, in terms of um, what you said about uh, the-, the, the, the the, there's just the, so much in this passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, there's you so much. That. There's so much here, uh, because here he even reference uh, the character of fiction. Uh, yeah, it's great. And 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 the notion that identification produces <laughs> necessary fiction for, as an effect of it, which is why, if he was a nominalist, then he would be for a theory of identification, but he's not because identification produces a type of, um, let's say strengthening of semblance, right? And right. Lacan doesn't want to do that, which is also why he's not an advocate of the ideal, right? To strengthen the ideal or to strengthen the ego would fall into this charade of semblance, which we might add is precisely the orientation of the liberal, right? I was just about to, I was about, yeah. about to, you know, in terms of, I mean, you could take all this and you could apply it to exactly what's happened today with, you know, the sort of yeah, yeah, because mass parasocial relationships. The liberal, the liberal literalizes, they, they, they miss the fiction in this operation. Right, sure. But wait, I always want to add somewhat of a post-Marxist historicist argument, which is that I might say that because of Lacan's commitment to a structuralist um, anti-historicist perspective for various reasons he has to take that point. He cannot think any kind of historicist dialectical perspective, which then creates something of a, so that we cannot think of the rise of fascism as a, let's say, let's say, um, how can I say, a, common occurrence 
to arise from capitalism. That is to say, a banal a, you know, emergence from capitalism, not a absurd emergence, not a surprising emergence, but a yeah. not a absurd emergence, but a normative um, cap, a dialectic emergence from capitalism. So wait a second. You're saying you're saying Lacan does not give us that. He does not give us that. I'm saying. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not I actually, sure. I actually think he is giving us that. Okay. I think he All is right. giving us right. that. Honestly. Okay. 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 I mean, that's how I read it. I mean, I think you okay. have to do some. You have to do some work to 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 uh, uh, to see that. Um, but I think you can you can piece it together. Okay. I think he gives us the tools to well, piece it together. The expression, I mean, what, what differentiates it is how he's interpolating enjoyment into the fact that if we're talking about the, the emergence of fascism, yeah. you know, if you look at, say, Trotsky's, you know, you know art of crisis and it's when capital and crisis, etc. you know, they give, no, they give no expression to how enjoyment comes into it. Um, you know, when Lacan's very much <laughs> talks about it in, in, in ways that are, are extraordinarily salient. Well, no, especially I, if we're talking I, about I, the, the, I think the answer there, I think the answer, Andrew, would be this. In what way does a fascism emerge, which is no longer contingent on a surplus enjoyment community seeing itself as, and, and sort of caught up within that dialectic? In other words, is there a nihilist fascism on the horizon? Because I think Trumpism is still very much this, yeah? But I think there's a possibility of a fascism, which would be a true post-fascism, which would be not tied up in this particular dialectic of, of, um, of the relationship between this uh, uh, pressurized surplus enjoyment uh, cognizant of itself and that whole dynamic. I don't know what that would look like, but I'm, well, we might have a situation where we have, kind of, where we have um, in neoliberalism, the university discourse of post fascism. So they have to repress fasc the emergence right. of fascism. So, yeah. It's worth, it's worth thinking about. It really is a terrifying question if we ask ourselves what happens when fascism stops enjoying itself. Well, that's yeah. actually like, actually I want to ask Frank about QAnon in this context, because I'm sort of wondering, does this describe the contours of QAnon? That's a well, good question. It, it, I, the one other question I'd raise is, right. does it explain, I, isn't this what we all often mean by the term black pills? Um, that's actually a good point, because I think the field of otherness in, in black pilled, that whole virtual black pilled structure, is different than the discourse. Like we need a new math theme structure to describe black pilled, in my opinion. Like precisely because he's really working off of Freud's group psychology text here. Um, and I'm not sure that that holds in the virtual. But well, I well, can I just come back to what Aaron's talk about, about black pill? So I've, I've, yeah. what I, I, did, I did write an article on, on the whole red red pill movement. I wrote it for RS21 and what it was and why it was dangerous. You know, so, and then later on you had this whole red pill move, so black pill movement. Yeah. And I did some so some little research on it, but you know, I, I, I sort of got a bit bored of that whole that whole thing. But what was fascinating about it was the people who engaged in it, right? They 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 were obsessed about their features in such a way that they would literally um, take photographs of themselves, post them on forums, and say, my bone structure is wrong. It's terrible. Look at it. And then they would draw diagrams all over the face saying if they're going to get an operation, they would, they would change it. And then they would Photoshop. And, you know, they were, they were highlighting constantly the ridiculousness of their, of their feet. It's, and you look at it, and it's just, you know, well, you know well, the DSM-5, it's, it's, it's body dysmorphia. But, the, but it's how they, this focus on on their own perceived semblance or how they, yeah. they, they bring Internalized that- Internalized racism. And well, I, think, this... I, think, I think the logic of identification, the logic of identification in these communities is more opaque to me. But again, I do want to see what Frank thinks about, because he's thought a lot about new forms of fascism. 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say we've been thinking about a lot of new forms of fascism. Sorry, I say we, I'm working on a paper with a colleague, uh, Dr. Sean Witters at University of Vermont. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost done. But anyway, we're, we're looking at, uh, at the category of addiction um, and trying to have it sort of speak for itself in a compossible way, apropos psychoanalytic, um, psychoanalysis and politics. And um, thank you, cool. Um, and yeah, we're looking at QAnon um, as exemplary of a certain sort of ad addictive subjectivity, but really the way I see it is that it's just a classic case of disavowal. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, they align, they identify as, as fascists, they disavow that and they go after anti-fascists thinking that the anti-fascists are these enemies that are you know, disrupting and trying to abrogate a state of law, but really it's their very position that's an affirmation of fascism, even though they say that they're not fascists, but you know, protectors of law and order, that is really disrupting, I think, and threatening an abrogation of law. Um, you know, whether this is a new form of fascism, Honestly, I think some of the new forms of fascism is, is what we see with a lot of on the, I mean, with, with a lot of corporatism already. I mean, what happened after World War II was much of, much of fascism got atomized, dispersed and reabsorbed into neoliberal structures. And a lot of it I think has been completely uh, maybe sublimated a little bit, but it's there in reserve. And I think, you know, the second that capital actually encroaches upon a crisis, that isn't really a, a cyclical crisis for yeah. uh, augmenting its 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 uh, auto effectuation the way it develops. It will it will call upon its fascist reserves to protect itself. And I, I agree with Todd McGowan essentially right there that what really is a harbinger for fascism is a real crisis that actually threatens capital. Um, and in this world, we might be you know on the cusp of of those operations of capital being under real threat of coming to a standstill. And and that's I think you know. If we get to that point, then we might see novel forms of fascism. I think QAnon is, is sort of a, 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 on the one hand, just a, a, a group of perversion uh, sort of acting out um, and misidentifying, and also on the cusp of perhaps if things socially, economically get worse, then yeah, manifesting a novel form. Um, but of course, I think bringing with it also past historical forms as well, right? The survival of these forms, are, the conditions for that survival of that form is, is is here it's it's present uh it's just not acute just yet and hopefully it won't be yeah, but helpful. i don't know um, that's that's really helpful yeah I, I was wondering more precisely if the logic of identification has the same structure that he's articulating here um but yeah uh, it's okay we can we can kind of we can definitely move on we have about 10 minutes left maybe we can, can i add something about this relationship with enjoyment Wait. i just got this big idea. I don't know where it's exactly going because I just read uh, the new forms of fascism of Enzo Traverso. And he explains how there are many phases of fascism, right? And how fascism should be differentiated from Nazism because it's a proper ideology in Italy that rises in Italy. And especially because it's an, an ideology that has a, a, a conflict with the communists. Right, because uh, Mussolini was part of, of the socialist, uh, part of socialism for, for their beginning. And then it's almost like mm, trying to speed up this revolution, right? So right. I just wondered the temporality of enjoyment, right? Because Freud talks about this delay, right? So the best enjoyment comes, right? It's always from this delaying of my enjoyment from this desire that gets into my dead drive, right? So I wonder how is this enjoyment of this presence of the moment I want to enjoy now that makes this the logic of fascism, right? I want my enjoyment by now. I don't want to wait for the future, right? It's yeah. interesting how that relates to sort of um, canon and, sorry, and, and theology. I mean, like, and I mean this in a very sort of specific traditional sense of, of eschatology, insofar as the end is, is, is something that's you know, going to happen, the apocalypse, but it's something that they enjoy now. It's something that the end is interfering, coming in, in the here and now, and there's a word for that, it's called prolepsis. They are enjoying prolepsically, 
you know, this idea that in the in the here and now, the end of times is about to happen. I remember they're all sat around, you know, the new, and they're expecting, you know, the inauguration of Biden, some huge um, apocalyptic uncovering of 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 all those things and that enjoy. And, and it never happened. It never happened. And the canon didn't disperse. What well, this? It's it's now been apparently from what I've read. Now it's been absorbed even more into sort of evangelical churches than ever before. I was just reading an article recently, but but it's still um, it's still coloured by this constant uh, eschatological expectation of the end about to interrupt here and now. I think that's a really interesting way of being able to look at fascism as um, of, you know, a rushed revolution, rushed enjoyment. You know, I thought that was an, an interesting intervention. Does anyone else want to say anything on that? I, I um, would, I, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kate. Yeah, I just real quick, I just wanted to push back a little bit with the common identification. I think flows in the fascism thing a little bit because those praxis of, of, of disidentification, you know, the fact that there is pressurized surplus enjoyment of a seminar would, I would say, almost be the fact that there is then an identification with Lacan. And I imagine him almost like ashing those peculiar curved cigars that he smokes. And you can see it in the film seminar as he's talking about Hitler's mustache and the unary trait somewhat. So maybe it's something like a disidentification having to go through an identification. Well, yeah, but weren't you the one just saying that he puts himself out of the position of analyst, though? Yeah, but bringing... The, but from the perspective of the analytic discourse where he says that jumps around between the other three discourses sometimes and you could tell at least that it, maybe it's just even remnant of the earlier seminars like and that seems the whole process of the analyst is to, to bring about the semblance of the master here and there and the fact that he is in the position then of the university lecturer which is a little then different I'm thinking this is to like the other side of psychoanalysis then in the semblance of the master which then you work through in the transference in the clinic that there's still a process of identification which occurs. I think Tupanamba's book even implicitly touches upon it here and there that, that he maybe even hystericized Lacan to the point where he had to dissolve his school because of the identification he was seeing there. True, that's, you yeah, know, you're right. But, but I think we both are agree that he recognizes it as a problem in which he tries to circumvent in different ways. I think the other thing I'll say is that there's two different logics of castration in the, in the, 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 the fascist community where it seems to me that there's a kind of um, delayed castration, which would make sense, Frank, I don't know if you agree in this longstanding thesis. If he's saying here that we can understand the intensification of um, surplus in join and pressurize surplus jouissance and the tension that produces as, um, an, as a kind of logic by which racism is produced or a community of racism, which we're calling fascists. Um, if we can understand it that way, we also know that that discourse forecloses castration as well. So it's a different operation on castration, I think, um, which would make sense then because it's kind of like the sacrifice is put in abeyance and everyone is remains within, like they, they don't have to renounce. There's no renunciation of the surplus jouissance, which creates a, a, a kind of ticking time bomb or it creates an intensification, right? It's close, it, um, what the impossible is in, you know, impossible. There's always the possible, the pure possible is made possible. Yeah. In yeah. the fascist action, you know? Yeah, but I think there's some kind of violence of the body. There's, a, there's, there's, there's obviously a violence done on the on the on the on the type of shared enjoyment. I mean, maybe you could even say that um, the fascist body is one in which um, there is no scandal of the a lack of sexual relation, but on right. the side of a lack of castration, which is even worse. Because what Lacan is going to say in a moment is that there is a direction of humanity which could go back towards this kind of ancient Chinese wisdom, uh, which, so to speak, was capable of resolving the non-rapport of the sexual relation, which is a really interesting point. I think he actually says that in the next seminar day. Um, but I feel like, yeah, this other version is like the flip side of that in a way. Anyways, should we read a little bit more before we conclude for the night? Or are you guys yep. tired? 
Okay, we'll do just, a little bit more. Just give me a signal when you want me to stop. Uh, yeah, wow. you're right here with you will understand why better. You will understand why better when I tell you what the theory uh, when I tell you what the theory, the authentic exercise of analytic theory, allows us to formulate as regards what is involved in surplus enjoying. People imagine people imagine they are saying something saying something when they say that what Freud has contributed is underlay is the underlay of sexuality in everything involved in discourse. People say that when they have been pushed a little by what I state about the importance of discourse to define the unconscious. And then when they do not pay attention to the fact that I have not yet, for my part, tackled what is involved in this term, sexuality, sexual relationship. It is certainly strange. It is only strange from one point of view, the point of view of the charlatanism. <laughs> that presides over every therapeutic action in our society. It is strange that people have not noticed the world that there is between this term sexuality, what it, wherever it is beginning, where it is only beginning to take on a biological substance. And I would point out to you that if there is somewhere that one can begin to notice the sense that this has, it, has, it is rather on the side of bacteria of the world that there is between that and what is involved concerning what Freud states about the relations that the unconscious reveals. <clears throat> Whatever stumblings he himself may have succumbed to in this order, what Freud reveals about the functioning of the unconscious has nothing biological about it. This only has the right to be called sexuality because of what is called a sexual relationship. It is completely legitimate, moreover, until the moment when one makes use of sexuality to designate something else, namely what is studied in biology, namely the chromosome and its combination XY or XX or XX, XY. This has so absolutely nothing to do with what is at stake and has a name that can be perfectly well stated or the relationships of man and woman. It is ne necessary to start from these two terms with their full sense, with, with with what involves in with 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 what that involves in terms of relation, because it is very strange when one sees the little timid attempts that people make at thinking within the framework of a certain system, which is that of the psychoanalytic institution. They notice that not everything is regulated by the frolics that are presented as conflictual, and they re would really like something different, the non-conflictual, that is more restful. And so they notice, for example, that there is no need to wait for the phallic phase to distinguish a little girl from a little boy. They are not all the, they are not at all the same. They marvel at this. And then I'm pointing it out to you because between now and when we meet again, it will be only in the month of February, the second Wednesday of February, you will perhaps have time to read something because once I recommended a book, because once I recommend a book, that improves its circulation, which is called sex and gender. And gender, it is in the it is in the English, pardon me. It is by someone called Stoller. Very interesting to read because this gives an important subject of transsexuals. A certain number of, of very well observed cases with their familial correlates. You know, perhaps that transsexualism consists very precisely in a very forceful desire to cross over by every means to the other sex even by having oneself operated on when you are male. There you are. With the coordinates, the observations that are there, you will certainly learn a lot about this transsexualism because these are observations that are quite usable. You will also learn complete, the completely invalid character of the dialectical apparatus with which the author of this book treats these questions, and which means that there arises quite directly the great difficulties he encounters in explaining his cases. One of the most surprising things is that the psychotic aspect of these cases is completely eluded by him because he has no reference points. The Canian foreclosure never having reached his ears, which immediately and very easily explains the form of these cases. But what matter? The important thing is this, that to speak about gender identity, which is nothing other than what I have just expressed as this, this term, man and woman. It is clear that the question is posed of what emerges precociously from the fact that at adult age, 
It is the destiny of speaking beings to define themselves up between men and women. And that to understand the emphasis that is put on these things, on this agency, one has to take into account that what defines man is his relationship with the woman. And inversely, that nothing allows us in these definitions of man and woman to abstract them from the complete speaking experience up to and including in the institutions where they are expre expressed, namely marriage. It's getting a bit Catholic here, isn't it? But yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. All right. So it's, it's probably a good, a good point to cut the session right when he's getting transphobic. I feel that this is... Uh, no, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, kidding. A bit, bit no, uncomfortable, I'm, you know. No, no, I mean, it's okay. I mean, we already knew this about, I mean, this is what, 1971? I did yeah. look up I did look up this book. Um, it's unfortunate that he makes the point here that the the problem of Stoller's book, sex uh, and gender, is that uh, you know what he's saying here is that, well, if he would have known about my theory of name of the father, then uh, this person would have understood that what trans individuals are going through is a foreclosure. Uh, issue so that they are that it's largely psychotic so yeah you know I think that's kind of uh, a bit reductive and of course we should keep in mind at the very beginning of the next seminar 19 or worse in the second day of the seminar he will invoke probably his most anti-trans position so I think it's up to us to sort of tease out um, and to think over sort of this operation that he's making and he's elaborating here as he explains the non-rapport of the sexual relation and why it is that the Lacanian orientation in this way um, holds such a, um, I don't know, maybe pathologizing orientation to the trans experience. I think we all have our own ways of answering that question, but I think it's it's worth it to um, probe that problematic, um, given obviously that it's become such a live wire crisis, not for us, but for some for some liberal Lacanians, it's a real, you know, a real crisis, right? So what real, really strikes me is this sort of religiosity, you know, of, of language. It's almost you know rooted in this sort of I don't know sort of reductive natural moral law and he even ends on the question of marriage and you know it, it, you know it, it's stuff like that you know when you read in the porn, it really throws you but then there's this terms about you know he's not reducing it to biology he's all about speaking it's about speaking yeah. beings and you yeah know, there's these sort of points that sort of you know, you know you you sound it so there's this delivery which you know almost sounds like he's delivering from a pulpit but then there's these points that sort of you know hang on what's he, why is it you know most People would reference it in this way. We, you know, talk about speaking. You know, it's about language and our, yeah. you know, it's our yeah, performance there's of language. A lot of, yeah. uh, there's a lot of Judith Butler here in Gender Trouble already, in the way that, um, you know, that gender is structured off of discourse. It's not biological and all that, right? So, there's certainly a way to take this apparatus towards a more emancipatory treatment of gender equality and so on and so on. If yeah. I may, please. Um, I, it, just to bring this back uh, to the discussion of the threat of fascism, I, the, the idea that uh, trans, the, the, the trans phenomenon is a crisis is a lie. And under fascism, lying is used to subjugate history under ideology. So there, I think, is also perhaps an allusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, allusion to a new form of fascism right there, of course, born in along by liberalism, or at least you know, the way in which Lacanian liberals, at least, are seeing this as a crisis, and it's not a crisis, that's a lie. Um, and then mm -hmm. also, just to kind of go back a couple steps, uh, Luis uh, had mentioned something about temporality uh, in relation to fascism and Philip Soler wrote a book called Women. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but he was an intimate interlocutor with Lacan and uh, his main premise in, in that it's, it's a, it's a novel, but his main premise in it is that uh, the encounter with like the sexual encounter, the sexual liaison that bypasses the non-rapport 
is an encounter with the semblant. And so that makes me think about uh, sort of uh, an addiction to the illusion of immediacy that might actually characterize these new forms of fascism, um, especially when capitalism itself is this economy of semblance that gives this illusion that immediacy is readily present at hand. Um, and it's not, but it, it, it sort of, I don't know, kind of elevates it to this sort of positivized affirmation that it can be for those who I think strive or have this pressurized enjoying around these notions of immediacy. Um, but I, I do like the idea to think about what is the relation to temporality to fascism and it, does it have something to do with immediacy? Um, and then also, yeah, I think we should be careful about uh, the, the narrative that um, trans culture is a crisis. I think that that also uh, is, is somewhat of a, it has some fascist undertones to it as well. I think David's talk, um, which I'll send, uh, I'll send it out. We may be publishing the various like interventions from the desire of psychoanalysis. His is quite nice in that way because you'll remember that he does accuse Malaire of complicity with a certain form of disavowed neoliberal fascism, which is a beautiful point in the sense that Biden and Macron and all of these Western enlightened neolibs. Um, they support on paper Saudi Arabia and all of the, the various, you know, South American dictators, right? Um, yet they get off scot-free with that in a certain sense. So I think there's a certain, um, yeah, there's a big time disavowal there. I mean, um, Biden just gave billions of dollars in appeasement funds to Bolsonaro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it was to protect the rainforests. A lot of the environmental activists down there are up in arms about it, figuratively, maybe literally. And, but yeah, I mean, there you go. There's lockstep alliance with fascism on the neoliberal side. Yeah. 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 So there's so much to gain here. I mean, there's like, you know, one little paragraph of a seminar and you can just, it gets, it gets you going. It's ele electrifying. So thank you all very much for tonight once again let's pick it up again it just gets better he read ahead and enjoy it and um enjoy the umbra stuff and the chiesa stuff as well and um all the best first odds have a, have a good and thanks very much you thanks know. for reading, mark you did no great worries. and I, I, you know what time is it there now it's about like 10 p.m 3 a.m all the best guys Godspeed. Take care. Thank Bye. you.